there. And how come they can sell? How come China can sell them in 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 Britain? Well, because we've lowered our import duties. That's what the first 50 years of opening up a free trade at the GATT and WTO has been about. And the next 50 years has to be about just getting rid of the protectionism in agriculture uh, and in many services. Um, you know, we're, we're only part of the way there. You can't criticize that the WTO didn't have any rules on agriculture at all until 19, 1995. We're the first step on a, on, a, on a long road. It takes time. But the direct, we're going in the right direction, thanks to the WTO. Do you think uh, globalization can do for Africa what uh, it seems to have done for Asia in the last 50 years or so? I think at the moment Africa faces a huge problem because of AIDS, which means that even with free trade it's going to have a huge, huge difficulty. Um, I think also there's a difference in that uh, uh, Asia had good government. Uh, as well as free trade. And one of the points of my book is that uh, free trade and, 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 and good government are not uh, in opposition. On the contrary, they go hand in hand. And the globalization doesn't mean less government. On the contrary, it, it, it sometimes means more uh, and can be, should, certainly should mean better government. Um, but uh, I think you know, Africa faces many challenges, uh, which means that though there are some countries which are well-placed to benefit, uh, others are going to need a hell of a lot of assistance uh, as, well as, uh, as well as free trade. But certainly, uh, free trade will do Africa no harm, and it will do it, in many cases, a lot of good. Do you see any evidence of them even buying into the ideology that, free, that a rising tide lifts all boats? Um, well, as I said, you see specific countries which are doing well, places like Uganda, places like the Maldives, places like um, uh, Lesotho. Uh, but yes, uh, many countries in Africa, one, are still protectionist, uh, and two, because of all sorts of other reasons, like you know, if you have a civil war going on, then free trade isn't going to help you very much. If you have uh, a third of your population uh, infected with AIDS, um, then clearly also you're going to have uh, a problem. Um, so we're not saying that uh, free trade works miracles. Clearly it doesn't. But um, still, there is no country that had ever got rich without pursuing free trade. Uh, jo uh, Joseph Stieglitz again, he said, if the United States, the richest country in the world with a very low unemployment rate and a strong safety net in terms of social security, says it needs to protect its steel industry. What must every developing country in the world be saying to itself? That's J Joseph Stieglitz's question. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I agree with you. That's a very poor example. Um, and I think that uh, in, in the case of, of agriculture, rich countries don't practice what they preach. And I think that rich countries should get rid of those subsidies. And as I said, the only way that's going to happen is through, is through the WTO. I mean, if we're, if we're talking that, uh, about the alleged sins of globalization, one can hardly say uh, that, it, uh, one can hardly criticize globalization for the fact that there is a lack of globalization in agriculture. Yes, we need more globalization in agriculture. We need more globalization in textiles. We need more globalization in steel. No, it goes without saying. Get rid of these tariff barriers, certainly. And the only way it's going to happen is through the WTO. A lot of people are very worried about the effect uh, of globalization on food security, and especially in communities and countries where people traditionally have eaten locally, mm -hmm. produced locally. Uh, in India, for example, Vandana Shiva, the director of the Research Foundation for Science, Technology and Ecology, said this, deregulated imports means importing hunger and unemployment. Deregulating imports are a major cause of poverty and famine in India. Globalization has dismantled the systems which guaranteed domestic market access for farmers, a system which brought food security to the poor. Except it doesn't. I mean, actually, uh, India has an obscene uh, food subsidy system which benefits a few rich farmers uh, and leads to mass starvation uh, in, in, in many areas. And it leads to food being stockpiled in warehouses where it rots rather than going to benefit uh, the people uh, who need it. Actually, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious that uh, if you're poor, you spend most of your money on food, and if you make that food more expensive, which is what import barriers do, they're a tax on foreign food, then that, benef that, that harms uh, the poor. And you see an example, uh, I used to work uh, for Mike Moore at the WTO, uh, he, was in New he was Prime Minister of New Zealand, uh, there, they, they liberalized, uh, their, there they liberalized their trade, and as a result of that, who benefited most? The poor. The rich can always afford to buy uh, even if it's expensive. The poor can't. They are the main beneficiaries of free trade. And the New Zealanders sw swept away their farm subsidies as well, things. And they swept away their farm subsidies, and the result was less environmental damage. It was uh, less soil erosion. It was, you know, all sorts of environmental benefit, and it was cheaper food 
uh, for people who need it. Well, you can forgive Africans, can't you, when they can see that uh, New Zealand has already done it successfully and uh, farming has not perished in New Zealand. Uh, when African leaders say, well, hold on, we'll believe it when we see it. Um, and I think that uh, rich countries ought to set an example. Uh, and I'm very disappointed at the farm bill. I am glad that since then the U.S. has made a proposal at the WTO to sweep away um, its new subsidies. Uh, the EU here is blocking uh, reform. The EU is desperate to carry on protecting its farmers, and I think that's plain wrong. And I think it's actually quite ironic here because uh, many of the anti-globalization protesters, their hero is, is, is José Bové, the French farmers' leader, and he thinks that we ought to be uh, protecting uh, farming in, in Europe even more. Now, that's obscene. Protecting farmers in Europe even more means that people in Africa will starve. It's plain wrong, and yet, you know, uh, they can claim to be fighting for, fighting for Africa and fighting for the poor. Well, since you mentioned Europe, you're no longer working for the WTO. You work now for the campaigning uh, lobby group Britain in Europe. Uh, it sounds like you're collecting, certainly by the standards of your generation, unpopular causes. Um, perhaps. I you think... want Britain to join the Euro. Um, I think that Britain uh, should join the Euro if the economic conditions are met. Uh, it, looks, it looks like they are very close to being met or are being met. Um, and uh, the Chancellor has said that if it's in the national economic interest and he has to assess this by next June, that there will be a referendum. Uh, I expect him to assess them positively. Um, and uh, I expect them that if there is a referendum, that it will be won because British people will see that they don't want to be isolated from the rest of Europe. They want to be at the heart of Europe. So the signals coming out of 11 Downing Street, the Chancellor of the Exchequer's office, uh, in the last few days are very different, aren't they? I mean, the, 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 they can't have been lost on you. He's no longer talking about the five tests. He's now talking about the uh, inalienable weaknesses, as he sees them, of a rigidly fixed exchange rate. That goes way beyond the five economic tests, the famous five. Well, the paper you're referring to is actually about exporting Britain's economic model to developing countries. It is not actually uh, about Britain and the euro. Um, and the paper talks about uh, the benefits of Britain's economic model. And you see the Britain's economic model actually is very close uh, to Europe's economic model. It involves an independent central bank setting interest rates. It involves uh, fiscal rules with some discretion. There's not actually a world of difference. There's a much bigger difference, say, between Britain and the United States uh, or Britain and much of the developing world. That paper you're referring to is, uh, is not about Britain and the euro. Philippe Legrain, thank you very much for joining us on Hard Talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm.